right? It's been a minute since we've done a Zoom meeting. Our last three or four have been in person, so you can tell it gets a little clunky. Anyway, shaving off some of the rust here. Okay, where were we? Memphis Astronomical Society. Again, we're a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education, astronomy, and related sciences. If you would like to learn more about us, check out our website, memphisastro.org. We also have a Facebook group. And once again, if you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to this channel. We have videos of our past meetings as well as other events. So it's a great way to kind of get, get to know us a little bit better and to engage with us. All right. If you'd like to join MAS, simply scan this QR code right here. That's one way you can do it. Or you can go to our website, click the join button, and you have two different options. You can either join as a member, which we recommend. It's $25 a year, a lot of member benefits, some of which we'll talk about here in a minute. Or if you want to just subscribe to our email list and receive updates on future meetings or other observing slash outreach events, you can do that as well. So QR code, if you got an iPhone, there it is. Or just click the join button. Calendar of events, December 1 today. Hope everybody's getting ready for the holidays. It's happening in a hurry. Now, tomorrow night, we were scheduled to be at Pine Crest. That has been canceled. We're going to reschedule for some time next year. We're still on for Burton's weather pending. Advanced forecast, not looking great, but we'll make the official call tomorrow morning. If we're clear, we'll go. If not, then we'll cancel for tomorrow. We'll make the call again, the final, the, the go, no go call tomorrow morning, December the 2nd. Now, the following Saturday, we're planning to be at Astro Flats, and this is our members only dark sky observing site. So, this is a benefit of being a member. You get access. We, we, we sort of announced this formally last meeting. It's been out there now for a few months, but we uh, we opened up a new dark sky site we called Astro Flats, about 45 minute drive from Memphis. Merrill's the administrator. When you become a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society, you get access to Astro Flats and you can go anytime. It doesn't have to be on a Saturday or whenever we schedule it. They can be anytime during the week. So Brian and I are scheduled tentatively to go out there December 12, 13, around the time of the um, the Geminids, the meteor shower that comes in in December, so if it's clear. But anyway, we schedule one once a month, members only. So again, if you're not a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society and you're considering it, that's one benefit that $25 a year gives you is basically, unre well, unrestricted access to Astro Flats whenever you want to go. And you can get the code on the Slack channel or just reach out to Merrill, if, uh, Merrill Miller. He's not here tonight. He's traveling. But um, Merrill gives the instructions. And, and again, you get that on our Slack channel as well, if you're a member. So just want to throw that out there. It's, it's one pretty considerable. As a side note, I'll say that Astro Flats is going to be subject to more stringent rules about how you get in, get set up. Uh, there will be, you know, this is one of our prime places for doing astrophotography. So driving up with your headlights on in the middle of somebody doing imaging is, well, rude. <laughs> so we, uh, we have rules about that sort of thing. And, and that's why it's not open to the public. Uh, we just, we need to try to control that to some extent. And it's, it's a, Nice sight and not much darker than Burton's, if at all, but uh, maybe a little bit, but it'll be a con more of a controlled environment. So, yeah. And many of our astrophotographers have gone out there pretty regularly. I've been out there. And again, you can go anytime. I mean, if you're a member, you can go on a Tuesday if you want or a Friday. So, Burton's, we usually schedule twice a month or once a month on a Saturday. And you can see this past year, a lot of them have been clouded out. So it's been hit or miss and mostly missed this year with the weather, but Astro Flats gives you a whole nother layer of flexibility. So again, if you're a member, hopefully you're, you're up to speed on that. And if you're not a member, hopefully you'll consider joining us if you want to get out and do some more regular observing. 
And then the following Saturday, again, call for scopes at the, the MOSH, the Museum of Science and History, formerly known as the Pink Palace Museum. They're having an observing on the lawn on the 16th. Uh, Mark, again, oversees the outreach efforts, outreach committee. And we, we've we been sending an email out to our list to kind of re recruit scopes. We're, we're formally calling this the Light Bucket Brigade. You don't have to have a light bucket, just any telescope. But um, we, we always need telescopes for our in-town outreach efforts. So if you're free Saturday night, December 16th, Please consider taking your telescope out to, again, the Pink Palace, MOSH, Museum of Science and History. And we send these email surveys out, or it's not really a survey, it's a, it's a questionnaire about whether you can come or not. It takes you maybe 10 seconds to fill it out, just click it, and then indicate yes or no whether you can make it, and then what telescope you're bringing. And that way we, we have a tentative idea. And again, we'll make the go, no, go call the morning of if we're clear or not, depending on what the weather does. So that's two weeks from tomorrow, December 16. And then after that, we're pretty much shut down for the year. And we got Christmas coming, New Year's, you know, things really start to get busy as we get into the month of December, which is nice because, you know, tonight it's December 1, so we get our meeting out of the way early. But anyway, um, that's what we got coming up the next couple, couple weeks here. Mark, Mylon, Rick, anybody? Did I miss anything? We good? You got it. All right. New members, again, I won't put you on the spot, but I just want to mention you and welcome you formally to the Memphis Astronomical Society. Uh, Trish Hart, Jeff Stark, and Debbie Perry. And we'll just kind of give you a digital virtual applause and welcome you to the Memphis Astronomical Society. If you're on tonight, welcome. And uh, we look forward to meeting you in person at our next meeting at Rhodes College next month. And hope to see you at a future event as well very soon. So welcome. And again, if you're a member, you get the Meteorite, which is our newsletter. Check out this month's edition. Uh, interesting article on some of the work that the MassFits have been doing with the Theater of Memphis. So they've done some really exciting work. And some of their images have been on display over there. So uh, some pretty uh, pretty interesting things going on with our astrophotography focus group. Uh, Astroflats, I talked about. I think this document is dated, but isn't the updated version of this on our Slack channel? The observing rules and all that? I think it is. Meryl's not here tonight. Um, anyway, I mentioned this last month. We just talked about it. You get access to this site if you're a member. Anytime, you know, seven days a week throughout the course of the year. So, and we have a document that kind of outlines the the guidelines. It's it's not it's not astro Nazism. It's just kind of astro courtesy courtesyism for our our astrophotographers. But anyway, just mention this again: astro flats. Hey, um, yes. If uh, for the astro flats, all you have to do is leave us a message on the. Uh, Slack channel. And when you do that, either Keith Ward, myself, or Merrill will set you up. Excellent. They'll give you the code. There's a gate with a code. They'll give you that code and um, basically give you instructions. So you can get access to this if you want to go observing just by going to the Slack channel. Again, if you're a member. Steve, Keith, Steve Wright, Keith Ford, and Merrill Miller are the overseers of this site. Uh, MassFits, they meet once a month. Is there a meeting coming up? I think it's TBD, to be determined for December. I know it gets pretty busy this time not of this, year. Not this month. Okay, so we're off for December. And again, a lot of us are getting really busy with holiday stuff. So MassFits will meet again in January and we'll announce the date. If you're interested in getting involved and learning more about astrophotography, this is an excellent group to consider joining. So videos of our past meetings are on our YouTube channel. Again, at Memphis Astron Society, we record every meeting so you can get up to speed. So, you know, if you're lonely this holiday season and you need to fill the time, this is an excellent way to do it. Just go back and watch the last two years worth of, of uh, MassFits videos. And, um, 
then we will announce when our meeting is going to be in January. Usually it's around the, the time of the full moon, either Wednesday or Thursday, mid-month, give or take. So kind of tentatively plan on that. This group is friendly to all skill levels, including those at skill level zero. Yes. So it's like a moving train. You just jump on and you hang out and you get up to speed as you go. But yes, whether you're advanced or you're a beginner, this is uh, kind of where teachers and learners get together. This is a, this is a great way to learn, by the way. You just start hanging around with people that are better than you and smarter than you. Maybe not necessarily as good looking as you, but you got to give something. And then uh, you pick things up as you go. So, but MassFits has done some pretty incredible things this year. This group has really grown, really taken off. Merrill, Merrill Miller, he's the one who kind of directs this group. And it's really an amazing opportunity. So definitely consider doing it if you're not already a part of this and you'd like to learn about astrophotography. Okay, um, that leads us to board nominations and elections. So we formally closed the nominations for the 2024 board at our last meeting. And we will open it up now for members to formally vote for the board. And again, these are your officers and these are your directors. So we have five officer positions, president, VP of programs, VP of Observing, Treasurer, and then uh, Secretary, as well as five directors. We have three people resigning, and we've got three people who have volunteered to step up for next year. Those are the, the names in yellow. So we've got Don Farage. I think I got the spelling right this time. Mylon, correct me if I'm wrong. And then uh, Patrick Mitchell and Bradley Harris, who's not only volunteered to serve, but also um, volunteered to be Secretary. For, for next year. So with that, I will go ahead and open it up. And so the motion is that we accept this roster of officers and directors um, by acclamation. I second. So we've got that motion is on the floor. And I think I, I don't remember how to do this poll. I think this is right. So let me launch this poll. Answer yes if you agree. And you, if you're a member, if you're not a member, please don't uh, bother to vote. You should have a poll. Does that work? Yeah, I see it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Give everybody a second to make your choice. It's essentially a vote by acclamation. And Rick, let us know. I'm not seeing any results yet. I don't know what that means. I sent mine. And the expert on this. So has everybody voted? Yeah. Everybody's voted. Anyway, we can... We can uh, uh, Use verbal voting too. And uh, all in favor, say hi. 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 Anybody opposed? Hi. All right. All right. Good enough. Done. <laughs> well, this is it. This is your board for 2024. Right. Looks like it's official. Say Thank you to uh, the board members that we lost this year and um, welcome to the new ones coming on. And for those of you that aren't on the board or haven't served on the board, um, I hope that I'm not sure I can explain to you how much um, these people work toward providing uh, what we can do, what we do, which is, of course, not just these meetings for your uh, use and entertainment, but also uh, a lot of public events and stuff that we do to try to uh, provide educational opportunities for folks. And um, there's, there is more work here than we have people and time to do, and they do an excellent job of it. So thank you very much. Um, also, 
uh, coming up with programs every month is a challenge. Uh, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of it, but, um, but we could always use ideas. So you don't have to necessarily come put on a program. We'd love for you to, if you want to, but if you've got ideas for programs, let us know about it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a volunteer army. Many of us have full-time jobs or businesses to run. So we're dedicating time to this, this effort and to the people who are stepping off. They've earned a much needed break and their efforts have, have certainly helped us grow and continue to grow over the last few years. And uh, there's a lot of work that, that, that goes in and a lot of sacrifice of time and energy and effort. And I think about the, the outreach activities and, yeah, programming, whether you're doing a presentation yourself or you're finding a speaker or serving on a committee or just anything in general, even just coming to a board meeting and and uh, slogging through that every month and, and uh, helping us make decisions is a commitment of time and effort. So, so if all of yeah. that didn't convince you to get involved, understand this. The officers and directors have more fun than all of the rest of you. <laughs> 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 you. absolutely so mm. there it, it definitely comes with uh with its benefits so it's not um and you know in all honesty it's what you put into it you know you get out it's like anything else whatever whatever you're able to commit even if you just come to a meeting once a month via zoom uh that's enough quite frankly so you know just uh participation takes us a long way there and then uh ideas and some of the people too that have come out i just want to make one other point here before we move on because uh you know you got people that that uh, come to our meetings but there are also a lot of people who don't necessarily attend our monthly meetings but they do bring their telescopes out to our outreach events and that also really helps us out a, a great deal so if you're the kind of person that just loves taking out your telescope and showing off the night sky and you come to our outreach events regularly. I mean, that helps us out tremendously. So that's, that's another way that you can get involved. So there's just multiple ways, whether it's, you know, actively serving as a board member or serving as a, as a committee member, or uh, like I said, coming to outreach events, or if you, even if you hear an idea of a speaker that you think would be interesting or a topic that'd be interesting for our group, you know, all that stuff just really helps us. So it's a it's a group effort. And again, synergy is where the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And we've, we've certainly seen a lot of synergy in the Memphis Astronomical Society over the last few years. So again, to the three people that are stepping down, thank you again for your efforts. Rest while you can, because we likely will be reaching out to you again in the near future. You are unofficially key staff, and you're welcome to attend any board meeting at any time and offer input. And again, your contributions have been invaluable, invaluable, and you've earned a much needed rest. And to the people coming in, thank you. And we're looking forward to working with you and, and serving with you. So we get another strong board next year. Okay. So next month, we will be, again, back at Rhodes College. We are, you know, once we get past the holidays, we're on the countdown to another solar eclipse. So again, we got plenty of glasses. If you've been coming to our in-person meeting events, then uh, you know you can get them for free. So you'll get them for free again on January. So just wanted to mention that if you need glasses for April. And we will be back at Rhodes College next month, January 12th. That's the second Friday of the month. Uh, first Friday is coming right off the holidays. Many of us may have travel plans. I know I'll be out of town that week. So typically in January, we go one month or go one week ahead to the second Friday. But just letting everybody know, we'll be back at Rhodes College. Uh, we got Bill Bustler coming back, giving a very interesting presentation on uh, Sirius, the dog star. So he spoke at our last event and um, should be another excellent meeting. So be sure you put that on your calendar.
January the 12th. And with that, we're just going to jump right in here. And we do this again around the time of the holidays. Some of you may be considering telescopes as a gift or maybe even acquiring one yourself. And by the way, one, you know, I get, we get this question a lot. Where's the best place to get a telescope? How do I get a telescope? We have people reaching out to us periodically throughout the year with telescopes to donate to our organization. So sometimes that's the best way to, to get a telescope. And Rick is going to talk more about that in a minute. But um, telescopes, it's a journey, not a destination. So, you know, what you learn is, uh, as you go, there's a lot of pitfalls and there's a lot of things that um, can sidetrack you quickly where it doesn't get the use and maybe it ends up in either the attic or the garage. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So... Hopefully this presentation will help distill it down, give you some ideas and some guidance um, on how to make a good choice depending on where you are in this hobby. So with that, I'm gonna unshare, turn it over to Rick. The floor is yours. Okay. Looks like that's working. So, um... Welcome to the uh, So You Want to Buy a New Telescope Seminar. Uh, this, we, uh, uh, the title was uh, uh, generated for our newsletter and the artwork, which I absolutely love, Grinch with the telescope. That was hilarious when I saw that. And uh, uh, the artwork is provided by Sarah Wright, who is our resident uh, graphic artist and has provided uh, at most, uh, if not a lion's share, most of the artwork uh, that we use on our website and the rest of our social media and has really helped um, give the Memphis Astronomical Society an, a well need, an overdue facelift. Uh, the artwork is great and we love her willingness to continue to help provide that. In fact, as a member of the board of directors uh, next month, I'm going to make a proposal to the uh, officers that we uh, in, we increase, uh, we double Sarah's salary for next year. So I think we'll be able to afford it. It should be well within our budget. Uh, All right. So what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm I'm taking a little different tack this year. Uh, I want to talk about what to consider when buying a telescope. I want to um, re reverse a trend that has gone on since, and I've been a member of the MAS for 30 years. And for most of that time, our, our initial telescope advice to everybody is you know get a pair of binoculars don't buy a telescope come to mas observing sessions and figure out what you want to do then honestly i don't know anybody in 30 years that has ever followed that advice <laughs> so in the in the vein of uh trying to what is it, it doing the uh, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I'm going to try a different uh, approach. So I want to talk about tonight is basic types of telescopes, types of mounts, uh, some ideas for beginner telescopes. Uh, this is new this year. I'm going to talk about what I'm calling new technology telescopes, and they're really quite interesting. And then if you're not looking for a telescope, but maybe want to um, pick up some additional accessories or buy someone uh, an astronomy-related Christmas present, with some, there's some, uh, excuse me, some ideas here. We'll go over toward the end. So do what I say, not what I did. <laughs> so what we've said for forever is buy a good pair of binoculars and come to our uh, observing sessions. There are so many different kinds of telescopes and 
uh, every optical system is optimized for a particular use and uh, they're they're just different there's uh, lots of reasons to go with just about any of them um, and and picking one out is just tough and back when I got started um, in the mid 80s I had, gone to the Sears outlet store and found a Tasco four and a half inch reflector on sale for about half price. It had been returned to the store or something. And uh, I picked that up and took it home and looked at the moon uh, a little bit. The um, And I love this picture because I, I didn't have any pictures of mine, but this one's got shows the guy's got his uh, German equatorial mount with a right ascension axis laid out horizontally so he can uh, essentially operate this as an altitude azimuth mount, you know, as something. And, I, and it occurred to me the other day what the original alt as, so we got a lingo too, right? Uh, there's, there's all kinds of terms. Alt as is a certain kind of mount. It stands for altitude and azimuth. Azimuth is the compass headings and degrees and altitude is the uh, elevation above the horizon in degrees. This is the original out as mount. <laughs> so um, set this up in a way I, I looked at the moon. It Oh, another thing it had, it had a four millimeter eyepiece that was like a pinhole. You could barely see through. It was not, uh, the box advertised 900 power magnification, you know? Wow, that's going to be cool, right? Uh, all that stuff was completely useless. It did come with a 20 millimeter eyepiece, and that was almost low power enough to be usable. Uh, but we'll get into more of that later. Ultimately, it wound up back in the attic until roughly uh, the 1992 or three. Um, there was an article about a comet that was predicted to crash into Jupiter within a year. And I thought, well, no, that's going to be cool, and that's probably a once-in-a-lifetime thing, and I want a front-row seat. So I got this telescope back out and started playing with it, and looking at Jupiter and stuff, and I could tell right away it just wasn't going to cut it. So I started studying telescopes and what have you. I tried finding different kinds of eyepieces for it. That didn't really work out so good. Um, so I started studying telescopes. How much, what I want to buy a better telescope. And when you, when you start looking at this in general, you'll find telescopes typically fall into one of two fundamental categories. They're either long focal length or short focal length. And what that means is they're either designed for high magnification and a narrow field of view or low magnification and a very wide field of view. Now, contrary to what you might think, wide field of view with low magnification is for the stuff that's farthest away from us, other galaxies, nebulas, stuff like that. High magnification and narrow field of view is good for planets and the moon and stuff like and brighter things. So I was studying the magazines, and, and I'm sitting there going, well, that's sad. I mean, now I've got to buy two telescopes if I want to be able to do both, right? Well, it turns out a company named Parks made one that had, it was a, uh, a long focal length Cassegrain looking through the focuser back at the back, or a short focal length Newtonian using the Newtonian diagonal mirror. All you do is change the secondary mirror and uh, you change the focal length of the telescope. I thought that's brilliant. So I wrote to them and got a copy of their latest catalog and their price sheet and the 10 inch model. They had 10, 12, and 16 inch models, and their 10 inch model was $8,000. And that was uh, uh, that was, needless to say, at the time, certainly out of my price range. I'm not sure it's not still out of my price range. <laughs> but uh, 
Lo and behold, after the Sears outlet store closed, I used to shop the pawn shops um, looking for tools. And I walked into a pawn shop uh, about the time I'm looking at telescopes, and this thing is set up in a pawn shop. And I am sitting there jumping up and down inside my skin going, oh, my God, I cannot believe this. What on earth? I go up to the guy at the pawn shop and go, what's that? <laughs> Acting like I don't know, right? Thinking he probably doesn't know what it's worth. And uh, it turns out that the guy that owned the business next door was trying to sell it. So he had it set up in the pawn shop. I made a deal with that guy and bought that telescope. An eight-inch uh, Celestron, uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, a couple of spotting scopes, and a trailer to haul it all in for $2,200. That was a lot of money back then, but it was a heck of a deal. And I had this telescope up until, I, I don't know, five or six years ago, I finally sold it. Uh, this is research-grade optics. It is a heck of a telescope. It'd take about an hour and a half to set up, another hour and a half to tear down. I did see, um, I was used to set this up in my driveway in East Memphis. Uh, the night of the um, Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet crashing into Jupiter was cloudy, unfortunately. But the next night was clear, and I was able to see the dark spots on the surface of Jupiter as they rotated around into view, because Jupiter does a complete uh, day in about 10 hours. So I spent about five or six hours that night watching those dark spots rotate into view. And it was truly a life-changing experience for me. Because the other thing you do when you sit at a telescope and stare at a planet is see it come into sharp focus every now and then. So I don't care how well you focus everything, atmospheric turbulence will keep the image from being sharp all the time. You can tell it's changing, especially at higher magnifications. And But every now and then, it'll snap into perfect sharpness, and you just, it's just, you just get chilled from it because it's so clear. Anyway, <clears throat> So there, there's a, uh, that's kind of like diving headfirst into the pool, you know, before you really know how to swim. I learned a whole lot of stuff about astronomy after having bought this telescope and going, you know, if I don't get involved with the local club or something, this is going to wind up in the attic. And oh, by the way, it weighs too much to carry up into the attic. So, um, I'm going to get involved, and that's when I joined the Memphis Astronomical Society, and I haven't ever looked back. The next thing I did I actually was to go ahead and pick up a pair of binoculars because you start taking a telescope like this out into dark sky, and suddenly you realize if you've been trying to find everything from in town where you can see the constellations, you, know, you look at a star chart or something, see where something is in relationship to a constellation, and you can go find it, basically, by uh, doing that. You get out where it's really, really dark, and you'll find suddenly you can't see the constellations. There are too many stars. And uh, the binoculars really helped with that. So uh, I finally did get some binoculars. About five or six years later, uh, a friend, uh, Ben Hudgens, who was a comet hunter in our group, uh, Used a 10 inch telescope all the time, wanted something a little bigger, and he found a deal down in Florida on a 13 inch dob. And uh, basically, he was shoving this thing in and out of the back seat of a sedan and going out to dark skies to use it. He did that three or four times and realized it just wasn't going to work out. And I was able to buy that from him. And to that, to this day, that is still my favorite visual telescope um i will it's it's just it's too easy to use it's uh it's got wonderful it's um uh, they weren't this this brand culture odyssey was um hit and miss about the quality of their mirrors this happens to be one of the excellent mirrors and uh, uh it's just absolutely a dream to look through 
more recently, I've gotten into astrophotography. And one of the reasons for that has to do with public observing and light pollution. And we try to do the public observing events with all the light pollution in town, and you just couldn't, you don't get to see much. Uh, it's just tough. But with light pollution filters over a sensory equipment that's way more sensitive than your eye, such as a CCD camera, you can get images quickly. And I mean, within five or 10 minutes, you can have an image that shows color and has detail that you will never get through a, a uh, look at it, look through a telescope in the city. Uh, by the way, uh, there are some physical limits, some physics we'll talk about. One of them is to see color through a telescope, you need to be looking at something with at least about an 18 to 20 inch aperture. So we're talking big telescopes before you start to see color. So this is an eight inch um, rich accretion with camera and all this. And I can, uh, all this connects wirelessly to my iPad and I can show you pictures of what it's looking at inside of, you know, four or five minutes. Uh, the idea was to, and I've done it, we've set it up with a flat screen television or a projector and a big screen to, to be able to show crowds of people uh, this stuff. There's an alternative for this now. They've actually built this stuff into a, a single box anymore, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So how to choose a telescope. The fundamentals are aperture is the most important thing. Um, an aperture is the size of the main element. So if it's a if it's a, a refractor telescope, it's going to be the size of that front lens in the in the optical tube. If it's a reflector, it's going to be the diameter of the mirror. And uh, the bigger they are, the more light you can gather. With the more light that you gather, the higher the resolution of the image. And we, I know anymore we talk about resolution in the form of pixels uh, on a camera and stuff. This is not the same, but it is similar. The bigger the the uh, objective, the the higher the resolution is going to be. Magnification is um, not important. Well, it's, it's 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 not as important as some people would uh, might think. Like I said, that little Tasco said it was good for nine hundred power. Well, it turns out that a four inch telescope is good for about two hundred power, absolute maximum on a good night. Um, there's there's a rule of thumb that. 50 times the aperture in inches is the, uh, is the magnification limit uh, for any optical system. So uh, take that into effect. Uh, is bigger always better? So the answer to that is not quite as simple. Um, if, if you're limited to in-town stuff, can't get out to a really dark site, or get out when um, observing conditions are best. And you get into astronomy, you'll you'll start to learn about things called seeing, for example. It has to do with how turbulent the atmosphere is at any given time. Turns out that if you've got high-level winds blowing straight, uh, that's great when the high-level winds aren't blowing and you've got an uh, atmosphere that's just sitting there it tends to boil as uh cold air will start to sink warm air will rise it'll get cold it'll start to sink you've got this cycle of air pockets that are uh, basically just like boiling water and you're trying to look through that and the bigger the telescope the more that sort of thing affects what you're looking at the more apparent it is that uh, you've got poor seeing conditions. And that tends to start happening above 10 inch diameter uh, objects. 
So there's essentially three types of telescope designs. There's really more than that, but uh, these are the most common and essentially two kinds of telescope mounts. There is this altitude azimuth mount where you basically can rotate in a circle and tilt up and down. There is an equatorial mount. And these, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not an idiot, but I could not believe how long it took me before somebody showed me how that mount was supposed to work and it suddenly it clicked. But I swear I read the instructions and it couldn't figure it out. <laughs> but these, uh, uh, these, these uh, equatorial mounts, this, you've got to figure out which one is the right ascension axis and this is it. And that's got to be parallel to an imaginary line that runs from the North Pole to the South Pole through the center of the Earth. So once you do that, then this whole thing can turn as the Earth does. And then the other axis just allows you to point it at everything. There are, in the telescope arena, there are refractors. Um, that refers to uh, glass lenses. The, uh, the, the process of light bending as it goes through glass or anything else, water, the atmosphere or anything is called refraction as it goes from one medium to another from the vacuum of space into our atmosphere it will be refracted from our atmosphere through a piece of glass is another refraction what we do is by controlling the shape of the glass the angle at which it enters the glass and exits the glass can causes uh, cause it to focus at a certain point so that's refractors. Reflectors are, uh, that's that's a lot more intuitive. You've got mirrors in the house. It's light that bounces off of, uh, and in this case, they're going to be curved mirrors and uh, then flat mirrors. In the case of the Newtonian, this is primary mirror is uh, curved. The uh, diagonal is flat, and it directs that cone of light out through the eyepieces. Uh, then there are compound uh, optical systems where you have a combination of glass lens, curved mirrors, and another mirror, and what have you. So these are called catadioptics. So, all right. This is some examples of refractor telescopes. Uh, your binoculars are refractors. Uh, this is an a inexpensive refractor on an Altaz mount. This is a refractor on a German Equatorial. This is a spotting scope. This is much like a pair of binoculars with prisms, but just one side of it. This is a big commercial uh, refractor and this is the biggest refractor that was ever made. So there is a limit to how big you can make a glass lens before it starts to sag because you've got to support the lens at its outside edges and the lens is thinnest at its outside edges and thickest in the middle. It sags under its own weight and glass is uh, uh, not rigid at that size in these temperatures. So uh, I've, I've heard it called a, uh, some kind of fluid before. I'm not sure that that's right, but glass will sag. Um, so a uh, 40-inch uh, uh, telescope at Yerkes is the biggest one ever built. Uh, here is uh, young Mr. Einstein uh, here at this one. Uh, visiting the observatory in, in the 20s. So uh, all but the absolute cheapest refractors will have at least two lenses. Um, this is called an acromat. And um, uh, the biggest problem with refractors is chromatic aberration. Basically, uh, 
light of various frequencies doesn't focus at the same point. By frequencies, I mean color. The apochromatics have three or more objectives. The, the reason for multiple pieces of glass is that there are different kinds of glass, and the refraction index for each type of glass is different, and it can be used, you can use that feature to get the basically the three colors to focus at the same point. So here's the effect. Here's what chromatic aberration is about. You have uh, three different colors of light. They bend slightly differently as they go through the glass. They wind up at three different focal points. And here's what that looks like in the imaging. And this is from uh, camera use, of course. But this is for telescopes, for really faint objects, deep sky objects, you're not going to see much of this. They're faint fuzzies anyway. But for bright stars, uh, you'll see a bright star have rings around it if it's bright enough, and it's kind of funny. Uh, planets will be bright enough to you'll start seeing the effects of chromatic aberration in refractor telescopes. Uh, so. so double refractors, uh, your your binoculars. Um, this is, this is probably the most important thing. If you're going to buy a pair of binoculars for astronomy use, try to make sure that you get those that have BAK4 prisms instead of BK7. Uh, they are, they, BAK4 simply gets more light through them. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for it, but BAK4 glass is actually more transmissive than BK7. Also know that uh, and and uh, back to a physics lesson here, light doesn't go is isn't transmitted or reflected from anything at a hundred percent, right? So every time light is goes through in a lens, out of a lens, into the next lens, out of the next lens, uh, reflects off a mirror, you're losing some light, but. I typically will do for astronomy is try to find the best design I can that has that for what I want to do, but has the fewest optical elements in it. So, so I don't lose as much light, but you know, there, there's trade-offs in all of that, but it's something to keep in mind. It's one of the reasons I don't use um, zoom eyepieces because they have to have a lot more pieces of glass in that eyepiece to make it do that. Binoculars, anything greater than 7 by 50 is kind of hard to hold steady. Their 7 by 50 binoculars are a great pair to have for finding objects. Move on to reflector telescopes. So once you start getting bigger than 40 inches, or pretty much all commercial telescopes these days are reflectors of some design or another, including the Hubble. And most of these are castle grain in design. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, or a modified version of castle grain. This is a simple Newtonian. The James Webb is a castle grain design of sorts. Uh, this is the telescope I had. It will do both by changing the secondary mirror. These are really common. And a Newtonian on an Altaz mount that is sitting on the ground like this is called a Dobsonian mount. Uh, a sidewalk uh, astronomer from San Francisco a couple of decades ago made this mount very popular. His name was John Dobson. He, he taught kids and people how to make their own mirrors, how to make these telescopes uh, out of uh, construction tubes that were used to form concrete footings and stuff and uh, build these Dobsonian telescopes. Uh, there, It's a really common commercial design now, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, if you can only have one telescope, a Dobson's not a bad idea. This is a Dobson with an open truss tube uh, rather than a complete tube. There's reasons for that, including you can take it apart and haul it in a smaller car, that sort of thing. Anyway, 
the uh, features of a reflector telescope are The basic Newtonian is the light comes in, bounces off a mirror, hits the diagonal, goes out to the side of the telescope through the eyepiece. The castle grain design is different. It has a curved mirror with a hole in the middle, and then its secondary mirror is also curved. Now, that feature right there allows you to create a much longer focal length. Uh, then you reflect everything back to the center of the primary mirror and focus it out here. This is um, Schmidt Cassegrain's, any kind of Cassegrain telescope is typically going to be a long focal length telescope um, because of the ability, uh, what you get with that curved secondary mirror. The primary thing uh, reflectors are going to suffer from is uh, uh, issues with the central obstruction. So uh, this is an image uh, without a central obstruction. Here's one with it. What that means is that uh, this, this is blocking some of the light coming through. And I didn't show you, but right here, this Richie Cretion design, that, that last telescope I've got is this design. And this guy, this central obstruction is huge. It is a large part of the opening here. And because of that, that telescope is just useless for visual observing. But it is absolutely fabulous for astrophotography. Um, the The field of view that every bit of it is sharp and in focus there's reasons for that but uh, again uh, don't buy richie cretion for looking through it <laughs> uh, there's another thing called coma and that's the effect of the mirrors being spherically ground i'm not sure that all of them are anymore this is less common than it used to be uh me and celestron uh, Schmidt Cassegrains used to have this issue, uh, and they have gone to something called advanced coma free optics. So they're able to correct for the fact that the primary and secondary mirrors are spherical in shape with their corrector plate. Um, that spherical shape doesn't work over the entire field of view. To be correct, it really needs to be a parabolic shape. Uh, but those are hard to grind. So uh, there are other ways to fix it. Diffraction spikes, this is going to be common in all but uh, the Maxutov uh, reflectors. This is the uh, that spider that holds the secondary mirror in place out in front of the telescope. Those arms that go across there cause these spikes. The other thing about a, a reflector telescope is it can uh, get out of collimation uh, sometimes pretty easily, and you're going to need to learn how to recognize it when it is and recollimate it uh, when it needs it. And that is uh, not intuitive. It's pretty tricky. And uh, but that's what we're here for. We can help. <laughs> so uh, uh, and it's easy to do once you learn what you're doing, but it, it does take a minute. The beauty of reflector telescopes is that whole aperture thing I was talking about at the beginning. This is this is the best bang for your buck, the most aperture for the dollar uh, you can get. My 13 inch. Uh, of course, I, I, I bought it a lot. Uh, a 12-inch model now probably goes for somewhere around $1,000. You know, a, a, a six-inch good refractor is probably going to cost you about $6,000. So uh, it's, it's just uh, the best, the most aperture for your dollar is going to happen with reflectors. The catadioptrics are reflectors with 
uh, glass uh, correction. So this is a Schmidt Cassegrain, and it uses uh, the second. The primary mirror's got a hole in it. The secondary mirror is mounted through the corrector plate. That's what this front piece is called the corrector plate. This is separate and can be adjusted. These are real common. They're good telescopes. They're long focal length. There's um, there's tons of them for sale used, um, and and they're good value used. They're they're good value new, but uh, they are uh, long focal length telescopes. This is one called a Maxutov. Uh, I've never seen anything bigger than an eight inch Maxutov, but uh, in a Maxutov, the the secondary mirror is actually just a mirrored spot on on the front corrector plate. These things uh, don't suffer from the diffraction spikes, and they are typically really sharp um, imaging, uh, uh, verging on uh, the refractor. Uh, quality images but again you're limited in size and uh, they are typically rel relatively long focal length uh, you'll see some camera lenses built like this so with all that said and there are hundreds of variations on all those designs in, in 2010 I saw an article in Sky and Telescope magazine, and I keep looking at going back to it because it really was a good article. And uh, they made a suggestion for the newcomers, for young people. And if you're buying a telescope for a young person or even yourself, and you're just not sure whether how deep you want to get into this thing, these are the telescopes. This isn't available anymore. This is called a uh, Edmonds Astro Scan. They have one now that's uh, similar. I think this thing's just so cool. <laughs> I really would like to find one on eBay or something and buy it, uh, just because it was a it was a unique design. It was a ball that sits in this uh, in this mount, and you just uh, move it around what you want to look at. This is similar. It's an altitude and azimuth mount. You rotate this base and tilt it here and look through it. Um, and this is something similar as well. Uh, these are tabletop models. So these are great for taking with taking the family out on a camping trip or something. You want to set up on the picnic table and look at something, uh, that sort of thing. This is a uh, this is a four and a half inch uh, Dobsonian. Uh, this is going to be easy to pick up and move in and out of the garage or whatever. You just take this out in the yard, set it down, and go point at what you want to look at. Um, if you're buying it for yourself, if you're uh, a, a, an older uh, teen or a young adult, uh, I would look at something in the uh, eight inch range, six to eight inch range, maybe even 10 inch. Uh, a six to eight inch dive right now, I think you probably get for about 600, maybe. I don't know. I'd have to go shopping. I haven't been shopping. Uh, but these are excellent. It, this is, this kind of gets back to my 13 inch dive. It's my favorite go to telescope. I, I can pick it up with a two wheeler, set it out in the front yard, and be ready to observe in 15 minutes. It's just, uh, it stays in the shop. Uh, it's, uh, you know, even if you don't do it very often, you've got to, you hear about something that you want to go out and look at because it's a, a comet or something. You've got a telescope, go set it down and go look at it. It's, uh, I think these are just a great way to get started. No matter what else you do, no matter what are the telescopes I buy or sell, I will still have my dog. All right, so it's time to talk about some new technology. Now, this stuff kind of blew me away a few years ago. In fact, when it first came out, I seriously didn't believe it. This was the first telescope. This was the first one of these on the market. 
It's uh, made by a French company called Veonis. The telescope model is a Stellina. The Memphis Astronomical Society has one now. It, it was, I, when I saw them, it, they were out for a year and a half. And every time I saw one, I just, I'm going, uh, all they're doing is, is they're pretending to be looking at something and they're downloading images off the internet and showing them to you. Because you don't look through one of these. You hook it up to your iPad or your phone or whatever, and you get the images from it on your phone. I thought, well, you know, okay, I can fake that. <laughs> I develop software for a living. I know how to make that work. Uh, so, uh, but it turns out that's not at all what they're doing. Uh, and a, a couple out in Las Vegas did a, a YouTube video on it. And uh, uh, I saw that and, and was blown away by it. Essentially, this thing has got, it was doing everything I was trying to build a setup to do. It's got, uh, light pollution filters. It is got a very sensitive CCD camera, but above and beyond all that, it's got built-in GPS, built-in uh, what we call a plate solving capability. Basically, it can look at the sky, look at the star patterns, and tell what it's looking at. And if it's not looking at what you want it to, it can tell that and go find what you want it to go look at. So you just pull up an app on your phone and say, okay, I want to look at the Messier Object 42, which is the Great Nebula in Orion, and hit that button. And it might take it a minute or two, but it figures out where it's at. It figures out where the Great Nebula is and goes and points at it and it starts collecting data it starts collecting photons collecting the light and the longer it points at it the better that image gets and it does what in, in the astrophotography world we call image stacking so it just keeps stacking new data and new data on top of the image and it gets sharper and sharper mm -hmm. as you sit there and look at it and it's absolutely amazing and it can see stuff in town under bright lights and stuff that you can't do with a regular telescope. You can't do that looking through a telescope in the city. And this thing can do it and show it to you. So we have got one of these and a flat screen TV that we carry out and set on a stand for showing large crowds of people because it's better than having them stand in line to look through an eyepiece. It's something they're not going to see any color in. Or, or barely can see at all, and this thing shows them great images of it. But they're not cheap. You know, uh, Stellina was $4,000. Uh, they've got another model that's just out, uh, and I don't know uh, what the different... Excuse me. Just a second. I don't know what the difference is, but their next model is uh, 1500 they're, I don't think they're making Stellina anymore because there are other models that have come out that are in, less expensive and this just isn't going to compete in the market these days. Uh, Ann Viano, one of our members and uh, astronomy professor at Rhodes uh, College, has got a, uh EV scope. Uh, this is very similar to the uh, same uh, to the Vionis. Um, they've got two different models for two and four thousand dollars. I didn't realize those were that expensive. And then, on top of everything else, now if the, those are still out of out of range, ZWO, who is big in the astronomy in the astrophotography world, they make a lot of astrophotography uh, specific cameras and astrophotography telescope controllers and all kinds of astrophotography stuff and they're now uh, they bought this company and, and are providing a similar thing this is a small uh, 50 millimeter telescope uh, all in one again you just set it down with the phone app it figures out where it's at what time it is what it's going to look for where to find it goes and points at it and and starts producing images. Um, 
I think one of our members may have one. Uh, yeah, I've got one. <clears throat> it's John. It's pretty uh, cool. It's, it's pretty cool. All right. Now, you know, I, I can't imagine that the image quality is quite as good as the Veonis, but I can't imagine that, that uh, you know, there's not a substantial difference between $500 and $4,000. <laughs> so, you've got something you want to take camping with you or just you've got a trailer and you want to just sit up on the picnic table and just, uh, uh, just for your enjoyment, it's great. Yeah. Uh, it's not good for planets, but uh, as far as you want know, to see the Andromeda galaxy, you want to see some of the clusters, any of that. Uh, it it you know it does it it, it does plate stacking, uh, and with an iPad you can't beat it. But it's not as good as uh, if you're doing real astrophotography. It's not that great. But if you just want to get out and just show the kids or or just put on a little show for somebody, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a big thing, you know. It, it, um, I've been doing a lot of, I've done, I was a scoutmaster for a lot of years, and, of course, doing astronomy and trying to, uh, Boy Scout camps and stuff and getting them to stand in line at a, at a telescope to look through an eyepiece was always a challenge. And having this sort of thing available to show them, uh, especially kids, was just it's well worth the money, in my opinion. All right. Uh, here's another one uh, I didn't know existed. And I think there's actually even one more that I just ran across on the Internet uh, looking for things. I have no idea about this one. Um, but they're, they're out there. They're happening, and they're coming down in price. So, Both uh, Ann Viano and I have one of those. Really? Well, what about it? Uh, well, it has the smallest aperture, but it's also something you could hike up a mountain and carry easily. Uh, 24 millimeter aperture, 100 millimeter focal length. Uh, same idea as the others, but uh, yeah. it does not have to be level, unlike the others. Uh, and okay. it will do. You could you could polar align it, and uh, you could do terrestrial um, work as well. What a hoot! All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. So with the telescopes, uh, we've looked at the ones you didn't need eyepieces for, or you need an iPhone for. Um, and boy, those have gotten outrageous. I don't realize how iPhone 15 titanium. Holy cow. <laughs> I can buy a telescope for that much. Um, Eyepieces. Eyepieces are an important part of a telescope. Um, there you can you can uh, do what I did, go off the deep end and to buy and invest in a in a set of Nagler uh, eyepieces, <laughs> which are ridiculously expensive. But I, I've always had terrible eyesight. In fact. These are thin glasses, but that's because I've had the lenses in my eyes replaced. Before that, I, I had Coke bottle bottom thick glasses. And and so I've always had trouble with anything that had eyepieces. I, getting enough eye relief, getting enough uh, it's just always been a hassle. Uh, and I can't I can't take my glasses off and use the eyepiece focuser to get it because I've got a bad astigmatism on top of everything else. So, uh, so I've invested in good eyepieces, uh, but uh, I don't regret that. They're they're wonderful. But a good set of plossels uh, are, I think, an essential part of any telescope. Uh, owner's repertoire. I mean, I've got four or five telescopes now. And I wouldn't, uh, you know, plossels are good enough for most of them. My big uh, dob, I'm going to get out my big Naglers. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a, a lot of different optical designs. Remember what I was saying about the number of pieces of glass? For an example, this Erfel, you know, it's got a bunch of different pieces of glass here to try to achieve the focus that it's that it's doing in the field of view, but you lose light 
uh, they don't show anything about a a, uh, a variable zoom uh, eyepiece, but there are a handful of those out there, and those have got two or three more extra elements than uh, a fixed focal length eyepiece is going to have, and you just lose light through them. So I don't uh, I don't have them. I've got uh, I buy fixed focal length eyepieces. You don't need every five millimeters. I've got, I start with, uh, I think I've got a, I got a 55, a 42, a 32, a 20, no, a 16, a nine. I got two nines because um, I got a binocular viewer <laughs> and a four and a half inch Nagler's. And those, uh, uh, and it's and there are there are steps in between there, but you don't need them, you know. And and the best I think the best way to figure out what eyepieces you need after you get a telescope is to go to observing sessions and borrow eyepieces and look through your telescope with some of others' eyepieces. You're always welcome to borrow one of mine if you if you're looking for something. So. Uh, these are some of the more common brands, Lestron Mead, Orion. I am a huge Teleview fan. Uh, most of my eyepieces are Teleview, either Nagler's or Plossel's. Explorer Scientific, I don't have any of, but I understand they're good, and I don't do zoom my eyepieces. Finders. All right, so... Um, uh, there, most telescopes will have finders on them. They used to have finder telescopes, and and those were fine, but I, I never used them. I always uh, found more useful to use non-magnified finder to get in the right part of the sky. And then I've always used very low-power eyepieces to provide a wide enough field of view to find that faint fuzzy object I'm looking for rather than having a finder scope on my telescope. And then, you know, as I got centered on it, I would put in higher magnification eyepieces. That's always been my approach. It's worked well for me. And I just never have kept up with finder telescopes. Uh, this is a few of the uh, non-magnifying finders. They basically are like heads-up display in a jet plane. They paint a red dot on the sky for that shows you what you're looking at. Flashlights, red flashlights. So there's um, two or three here. Uh, this is Orion. I've got a bunch of these I bought before Orion uh, bought them. This, this has got a little thumb wheel. Uh, to dial up the intensity of the LEDs and we'll switch to switch back and forth between red and white. They're incredibly useful. I got a neck lanyard, so I keep it around my neck all the time when I'm out observing. I can keep a low uh, red light uh, for finding stuff. And then if you drop something in the grass, you can quickly switch it to white <laughs> so you can really see what you're looking for or at the end of the night when you're packing up. Same way with this, Rigel Systems flashlight. I've never uh, used one of these, but it's the same um, system, and so is the Agena LED dual beam. It's essentially the same thing. I think it's just a different plastic housing. All right, sky charts. Now, even with all the modern electronics and finding stuff and everything that we've got handy, printed sky charts are really still pretty cool. Uh, we wouldn't, we'd be remiss not to uh, plug our very own uh, Messier guides by Dr. William Bussler. And uh, those are available uh, on our website. I, I forget what the price is, but it, uh, they'd be a good deal at twice the price. It's like five or seven bucks a piece uh, with shipping and what have you. We still have some. They're, uh, they're wonderful pieces. Bill's been a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society since 1957, right? 
Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, he uh, he wrote these years ago. The good news is the stars haven't changed position in uh, that many years, so they're still good. There's a chart for each month, and then uh, he's got the and the Messier guides are. Uh, he's got instructions for how to do star hopping to find the Messier objects. So you finally go to a star, and you know, and then hop to the next one, and then do nudge the telescope a little bit that way, and you'll find the galaxy you're looking for. That kind of instruction. So they're very good for that. We also have on our website our very own sky maps that are by month, and uh, this is uh, uh, images of the ones for December. It's uh, you can download these in uh, in PDF form and print a copy. They'll have an observing list for each month, and those are free on our website. Then there's my favorite star atlas. Um, I had uh, I had a field version of this, spiral bound and plastic coated pages that got stolen, which I, just irks me. These uh, it's not available in that form anymore, but I do have a, a replacement paper version of the uh, uh, Wiltirian uh, Star Atlas. This is just they're beautiful. They they are uh, fun to look at and and use and and when the computer gets too cold and the batteries all quit because it's you know 10 degrees outside and you're trying to capture that last uh, Messier object before you call it quits uh, there you go you've got uh, access uh, the pocket sky atlas is highly re uh, revered I've never used one but it's one of the options that's available from uh, Sky and Telescope, of course, it is not a pocket edition. This is as big as the, the Wiltarian is like, you know, 11 by 17, and this one is too. Um, so Astrophotography Sky Atlas, I, I think that I've got one of these. It's very interesting. I got this back when I was doing astrophotography with film because one of the things it had was exposure settings for the various uh objects out there suggested places to set you know times for the exposures for whatever film speed you were shooting or whatever um uh, it was uh very handy it doesn't really apply to modern digital photography but it's still a really handy uh, guide uh, this guy, the Sky Atlas, is more a lot of a lot of uh, myth and uh, stuff is in here. A lot of um, stories to go with images, but uh, this is just a pretty book. <laughs> All right, electronic sky charts. Now, there's uh, <clears throat> th this again goes to. Uh, do what I say and not what I did. I own all of them. And the problem with that is um, if you try to use all of them, you don't get what you can get out of any of them because you've got to learn how they operate. And uh, I don't use the Sky X so much anymore. I'm mostly doing a Starry Night because it kind of resembles Sky Safari that's on my iPad. And I'm waiting for them to update uh, Starry Night for my computer to be as useful as uh, Sky Safari. But uh, hopefully that'll happen in the next year or two. This is my favorite go-to, though. I'm doing most of it on my iPad with uh, Sky Safari. Uh, and and by doing what I... With Sky Safari, you can do things like I can put program in all of my different telescopes, all my different eyepieces, all my different cameras, all my different hardware, and I can go look at a object and say, all right, if I want to try to image this object, how big is the frame going to be? What's what's it going to look like? What's it? And I can get all that calculated for me in the uh, in the software. So I get these uh, 
uh, I did all that to do the uh, solar eclipse. I wanted to know how much of the sun I was going to have in the field of view in my in the camera in my hydrogen alpha telescope, and uh, you know I was able to do all these calculations ahead of time to to basically show what kind of view I was going to have. It wasn't as wide a field as I wanted, but it did fine. Uh, Stellarium uh, is free. Uh, Starry Night and Sky X are not. Sky X is professional. Uh, it's a couple hundred dollars, I think. Uh, Starry Night was as well for the professional versions. Uh, Stellarium is absolutely free. And uh, there's another one. Uh, but I forgot what it was. It's French. What's the French one? Carte du Ciel. Sky yeah. Charts. In English. And, and, yeah. Sky Charts, but in French is the name. Carte <laughs> du Ciel. Yeah. So uh, there's those. Anyway, pick one and stick with it. Learn how to use it because the tools are, are essentially the same in most of them. You just, you're going to get the most use out of it if you'll stick with one and, and figure out how to use it. All right, laser pointers, green, 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 green. The, eye, the human eye is most uh, sensitive to green, so it's the easiest one to see being reflected off of the water vapor particles and dust in the, in the air as you try to point at something in the sky with it. Um, class 2 and Class 3A are 5 milliwatt or lower and are considered eye safe. You can buy on the internet cheap, inexpensive um, green laser pointers that are way more powerful than that and are absolutely not eye safe. So be careful. Uh, I've got uh, that. There was a the last batch I bought. I bought a uh, bomb off of the eBay mostly, and they're like either between ten and twenty bucks a piece. But but they'll be hit and miss. You know, I'll, I'll buy one one time and it's decent, and I'll buy another one and it'll be pretty lame output. So I think the last time I bought it, I bought like 10. <laughs> and out of that batch, I had five or six that were really good, high output green laser pointers. Kind of as you can see that beam, you know, uh, standing under a street light in the city, trying to point out something in the sky. So those are if you can see that green beam under a street light in the city it is not eye safe so keep all this stuff in mind don't point them at airplanes that is technically illegal and uh and be safe and i think that's it i will certainly uh pause for questions um uh, if you have any, and I hope that you were able to get a little something, if not just some entertainment out of that. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Hey, thanks, Rick. Everybody's giving you an applause. A very thorough presentation. Uh, does anybody have, we'll just open it up now. If you have any questions or comments, just go ahead and unmute, uh, unmute yourself. And feel free to jump in. So, you uh, you mentioned telescopes. So I picked that one up a few years ago. You know, you bought yours from Ben. I bought mine from Ben. Also, I have a twenty inch. That was, I jumped in, and um, we were at a board meeting when I was eight nine years ago. And Rick said Ben is selling his twenty inch. I didn't have a telescope at that time. I, I got my first telescope when I was nine years old. It was one of these cheaper department store ones, but. I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then I went the better part of 30 years before getting a telescope, before I picked up the 20 inch from Ben. And I uh, needed something a little more manageable. So I picked this one up. This is a 10 inch version of a Dobsonian. And I probably got more use out of that scope than any of them. Very easy to collimate, very versatile. Five minutes you're set up and it's been kind of my preferred scope for, for outreach. So yeah, I swear by the Dobsonians. Um, let's see here. Look at the comments. 
Okay, so how do you feel about go-to technologies like Celestron, Nexstar, 4SE? You want to answer that one? Or thoughts? Well, on I don't know the uh, Nexstar. Uh, they're all... So we went through a phase of go-to telescopes, but, but the telescope doesn't have any intelligence it just has it has encoders it knows uh it can know by gps where it's at and what time it is and that's critical and then some of them will have a compass built into them so it can tell which direction's north but all of those re will require at some point in its setup that you tell it what it's looking at so there'll be a one or two star alignment uh, process. Sorry. Uh, Rick, there is an X star that has the, a new technology where you just set time and date, and then you point to any three objects in the sky or two, and it will align itself. Yeah, but do you have to tell it what you pointed it? No. No, no, it doesn't matter. You just point it, center it, click enter, go to the next one, and it will find out where it is, and we get a line. It, really? I, I was impressed by that one. That is impressive. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that was my problem, you know. I, yes. I would go to telescopes because I didn't know what all the stars were named. Yes. And I <laughs> want to know what all the stars are named. <laughs> Yeah, my, my next star 6XC does that. It has the three star uh, auto align on it. You just go ahead and point at the three bright objects. It, it'll tell you it's successfully aligned because it'll figure out which stars they are and you're good to go. Perfect. There's also a star sense uh, kind of camera that does the plate solving for you for the, yeah. the alignment. But that's like 460 bucks. Yes, it's, it's, it's an addition to. Uh... You have to put the camera on the telescope and it will play solve and align the telescope. But for $400, you can buy uh, an ASI and connect that to the scope and that's it. Even if you are going to use it as a, as a visual telescope, you can do that. Or less if you buy uh, the new software that can work on any Raspberry Pi for 49 bucks. So. <clears throat> yeah i want to make one quick point here because normally in the past we've done this program in december and then we kind of do in january you know a how do you get started with your new telescope program after you get your christmas telescope we're changing it up a little bit this year um however we have hinton park now and as you've seen this past year on a monthly basis, we're going to try and offer ongoing mentoring services to anybody who wants hands-on help with their telescope. We used to do that once a year in January, and we, we did that throughout the course of this past year. We're planning to continue that. So just make a mental note. If you get a telescope or you're thinking of getting a telescope and you'd like hands-on help from guys like Rick or Freddie, who are excellent, as well as some of the others who have, have, have extensive experience with telescopes, on a monthly basis, Throughout the course of next year, 2024, we're planning to meet probably once a month at Hinton Park. That's your opportunity to bring out your scope and get some help. It's a great service that uh, MAS offers. So I just want to make sure I mention that here quickly. Uh, another question, power supplies. You got any thoughts on that, Rick? What power supplies you would recommend? Yeah, that's kind of like asking me uh, where to get uh, your electronics fixed. Uh, I don't know because I fix my own, uh, I build my own power supplies. <laughs> yeah, my my quick comment on that would be the power supply that works. And we <laughs> ran into this issue in Ely last uh, a month ago with, during the eclipse. <laughs> Make sure you have a backup on hand because if they go out, fortunately it went out the day before. So the power supply that works. Um Let's see here. You can okay. find uh, power supplies in Amazon. Uh, they they sell now these boxes that have uh, even have an inverter and have a, a cigarette lighter output and some other kind of outputs. Those work okay, 
Uh, yeah, and if it gets too cold, they probably will will reduce the voltage. So you may have issues. But in that case, I would suggest that you put them in a cooler yeah, and seal the cooler so the batteries don't get too cold. And and that can help. Yeah. And by power supplies, I assume you're talking about batteries, right? Going yes. out in the, in the Yeah, that's what I thought too. If you're in your driveway and you've got 110 volts, then uh, know, yeah, kind of long volts, extension like cord. Power supply, you get a long extension cord. That's it. So, can you talk about some other places? Whether it's a Walmart, a Lowe's, Home Depot, there's other places where you'd want to get a, a suitable battery. Or no, a normally, Jumpstar batteries work well too. They have <laughs> um, less capacity than the other power supply I was mentioning, but uh, they work too. That's what we wound up using in Ely, Nevada. Was uh, yeah. uh, they told us not to bring lithium batteries because shipping them is such a pain, right? But I have uh, a power supply for my ham radio, right? And uh, we took it out there, and the second night after it got cold, once it just did not come back on, it was dead. And uh, somebody had a jump starter uh, thing. And and I thought it's just you know all the connectors and because I've got all these serious connections and stuff because you don't want your computer in your your drive to come unplugged or lose power during the course of anything because then you got to you know stop it and realign it or whatever recenter it get it back up to uh, it's not just turn it back on so uh, but I got two big jumper cables clamped onto two little ring lugs. <laughs> It just looks stupid. I we'll see it in the video. I, I'm working on it. Yeah. It's entertaining. It but worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. Got us through it. Yeah. All right. Um, so you mentioned non-magnifying finders. I'm a huge fan of those as well. I don't know what I would do without my Telrad. So, of course, I use it on my 10-inch as well as my 20-inch. Kind of my methodology is I use that in conjunction with a right angle finder. I know those are controversial, but I'll use the Telrad to get close. So that's kind of my coarse tuning. And then if I'm zooming in on like a globular or a faint fuzzy, assuming the sky is sufficiently dark, then I'll use my right angle finder as kind of my fine tuning. I learned this method with trying to find M3. It's the globular cluster in Canis Vinatici. A little bit of a challenging target at first if you don't know where it is because it's not near any bright stars, but what I found out is if you can get close from the star chart in the in the Telrad, then if you look at it through a magnified finder like a right angle finder, you should see a faint fuzzy that looks a little different than a star, and then you just tweak your telescope and hone in on it, and then it should you know it should appear there. So it's uh, one of those little practice tips or one of those little tips I picked up just from practicing out in the field. So. I have kind of a love-hate relationship with technology when it comes to observing because on the one hand, it can help you find something quickly, but on the other hand, I like to learn the sky on my own first. So I personally would not recommend a go-to scope as your first scope. You know, get something like the Dobsonian that you can move by hand and go through the Messier catalog, learn the sky, learn where things are. And then when you become more familiar with the sky, the constellations, and the different targets, then maybe you can, you know, graduate to uh, an electronically assisted telescope or a go-to scope if you're doing outreach, because you don't want to be sitting there trying to find something when you're trying to show off. So that's just kind of my two cents, but everybody has a different philosophy. Um, Stellina has done wonders for outreach. And again, when you're doing outreach and you got people lined up trying to look through your scope, one of the other thing I found is the kids especially, they just can't resist the temptation to want to put their greasy fingers on my eyepiece. And that really <laughs> irritates me. I'm going to show up in a Catholic nun with a ruler next time and just slap people on the hand when they touch my telescope. Like, don't touch the eyepiece. So we don't run into that problem when we have um, when we have Stellina. But yeah, we you can see we have some pretty impressive uh, technology and some pretty impressive telescope options for, for outreach. So... Anybody else? We're kind of wrapping up here. If nobody has anything else. I did put a link into uh, 
to the Galactic Hunter. He just posted a video on the ultimate smart telescope comparison design and spec. It's a two part series and it covers these smart telescopes you just covered the Stellina one, the ZWO one, and a few others. And I just got the link there in the uh, comments in the chat. Thanks. Excellent. I've got that window open. <laughs> Again, um, Rick gave a couple of resources here for sky charts. You know, Bill's Messier guy, it's a great resource. I want to also mention uh, Steve Wright has done a lot of work to refurbish our, our sky charts and our Messier uh, catalog. So that's another great resource as well as our website. Can't say enough about Steve Wright and Sarah Wright and the job they've done to refurbish our website, our newsletter, sky charts and overall just our online presentation. So they've really given us a professional look. And I think we'll look forward to double both of their salaries next year. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, but uh, that's also been a tremendous labor of love for the Memphis Astronomical Society. So um, use those resources. And again, practice makes perfect. Get out in the field. Um, and again, you know, we have Astro Flats available seven days a week. So if you're a member, take advantage of that resource. We don't always get clear nights on a on a Saturday night. So, but if nobody has anything else, um, I think we'll wrap it up here for, for the evening and for the year. So anybody have anything else? Thanks, so, very Ken, much, everyone. Thanks for sticking around and listening. Yes, thank you. Um, December 1, we're off until the 12th of January. We'll send announcements out. Again, the 16th of December, if you can make it out, if it's clear, please bring a telescope to Mosh. And everybody, you know, stay safe and enjoy the holiday season. Get some rest. And we've had a great year. 2023 was strong year for programming, strong year for uh, outreach as well. And I want to thank everybody again for your contributions and for participating and really making this uh, another excellent year. Let's do it again next year. And with that, um, just wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and we'll just keep this going. Good night, everybody. Good night, Jeremy. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Everybody.